Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to the incredible Lucy Quist, the bold woman creating a new normal. The speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to be speaking on her platform because I think she's doing something that we all need to be doing. Change is inevitable. So I guess that when we are bold, change becomes less frightening and it becomes normal. And when change becomes normal, then we can be progressive. Well, I've been asked to talk, so I don't have a prepared speech. It's about building an African corporation. You know, so I'm going to tell the margin story, since I've, I've told it many times. I said my audience is quite useful, useful, so I have to tailor it to help you envision your future. So let me start by saying, I went to France from school. <laughs> How many mobile people are here? Uh huh. Where was here? <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, I can't tell you a rags to rich story. <laughs> that's not what here. Well, that's not what my story is about. It's not for rags to rich. My father was actually quite a wealthy businessman, and I went to one of the best schools that money can buy, Chapel Hill School in, in Takrati. And I went to Enfanspum School, that special school that's been here for 150 years, and it's created so many incredible leaders. Then I went to the University of Ghana, the law faculty. I was fortunate enough not to be sacked. In those days, there were 140 people and only 60 got to read law, 40 LLB, 20 BA. I was lucky to read LLB. Seven of the from boys that entered the law school, none of us were sacked. And after that, up to that time, none had been sacked. I don't know about the Wesley Girls people, Lucy, but. <laughs> then I went to the Ghana Law School and I became a barrister. I was selected to be a teacher's assistant. But then when I was in the first year of law school, I started a business, and that business is called the Margins Group. Most people ask me, why margins? And I say margins is actually the central theme of business. When everybody makes a margin, the business is successful. If you give your customers a product, a solution, and a service that's a margin above your competitors, you create a business. When your customers save a margin, from buying your products. They save money. If in competition you are margin above your competitors, you win the market. If everybody makes a margin, everybody's happy. The business is stable. So margins, right? Okay. So even though I didn't start from a rags to rich story, my father is somebody who believed that if you're going to be trained, you needed to go through the crucible. So I always used to say that you train a child like a servant so he can grow into a prince. And you don't train a child like a prince so that he can become a servant. So even though I don't have a rags to rich story, my rags to rich is self-imposed by my first mentor, my father. So in the age when I finished law school and I used to stay in, in London and work in my brother's office looking at what they were doing, aside doing odd jobs, the ICT revolution has started and things were changing as they change even now. And typewriters were going out of use. Computers were, were the in thing. I love computers. I bought my first one, I think 22 or 23. It cost me all my savings, 3,500 pounds. I remember a Toshiba with a modem and all that. That's all the savings I had. I thought of going to programming, but then I thought it would be too difficult. Why don't tell the programmers what to do? You just have to understand enough technology. Now, I didn't have money to buy computers like other people or sell them. So I looked at the whole value chain, and I decided the easiest entry point into this ICT revolution was the things that computers outputted, which was 
documents. So in that whole value chain, I decided that if we sold banking equipment and consumables and laminates to everywhere where people sold computers, we could make money, not just once, but continuously, especially if we consider of where we were selling these binders. Just a lot of my mates, and in between classes, we weren't selling these binders to companies. And we had so little money, because we started with $100, that we had to think. And that's what brings you to the first lesson in life. Penny wise, pound foolish. My mother taught me that. When you don't have money, you are forced to think. Actually, when you have money, you can be at a disadvantage. The first lesson I learned from not having too much money to go to these companies was that you don't take a taxi to a single company. Because if you lose the sale, you have to take a taxi back. So you take a taxi to a tower where there are so many companies, where your chances of success are higher. So that when you you can sell to the next one in the tower. Because so having very little money, we only targeted companies in tower blocks. I remember the first one we went to was Mobile House, now in Total House. There were all kinds of companies with money. You know, companies that use, could afford computers. Companies that printed stuff. And so, of blessed memory, and I, we wore our suits and we went to Mobile House. We booked appointments from the top to the bottom. We started from the top, I think like 13 companies. That day we made four sales, because we did demonstrations and we practiced so well that when we finished the demonstrations, people actually clapped. And I remember the partner for uh, Pimawik, which is KPMG today, Mr. Oko, telling me that, well, young man, if you wear the suits you're wearing and these binders that you're selling, there's some other people who came, but the way that you guys present will give you the business. And we had Pimawik's business, even when they turned to KPMG for years. And you know, they produce accounts. So we saw the binders and what he called the Pimawik blue, a comb that was as blue as their color, and the cover as blue as their color. And every year, when they were accounts, we sold thousands of consumables. Now, so even though we were minors and people didn't even figure out why were these guys selling these things, we sold over 2,000 of these binders to different organizations. We introduced them to Ghana, selling binders, selling laminators, making ID cards, selling to what you call business centers. In those days, we had business centers, we set faxes, we had made documents. We had more than three to 4,000 people on our books, and we were making an average of $1,000 per year, per population. And so by the time we were in our 20s, we were millionaires, literally. Just selling something as finance and laminators. But nobody saw that we were making money because we kept reinvesting our money into our company. And then, you know, as the ICT revolution was mutating, I decided that of all the things that we sold, the most interesting thing was identity, making identity cards and, uh, you know, making security features and ID cards. I found it very interesting because when I looked at the world, I thought there was nobody in that space. And I looked at alternatives, the options of selling these binders and laminators, too much inventory, too much people, low barriers of entry, theft, you know, all kinds of things. But identity seemed to be something that had barriers to entry. So I went into that. You know, one of my first mentors was a Swiss guy called Wolfus, Wolfus the Beggar, you know. Um, and he used to own a company called EBO. And he talked me a lot of the things I know about marketing and sales and business development from an European perspective because he was Swiss. He was a doctor of economics. He's a very bright man, very polished, very enlightened. And I remember the first time he met me and I was applying to have Ghana and West Africa as a distributor. He had asked me, what is the population of Ghana? I told him, what government do you have? I told him, I think I was 20. 24, 25. And he said, what's the GDP? I didn't know. So he said, oh, yeah, in business, you don't know what the GDP of your country is. So I said, well, I don't know. Why should I know? He says, well, if you take the GDP and you take the population 
and you multiply it, you get the size of the market. And if you take the, the, the political system and you look at how stable it is, you see the risk that you're facing. And I go, wow, nobody taught me business like that. You know, so I kept it. That's why I can repeat it to you. Because business is about opportunity. It's about market sizes. It's about the difficulty of getting into markets. It's about the risk of getting into the market. It's about the cost of operations. And it's about what your competitors have and what you have. Would you survive crossing the Sahara? All this is a system and it's a process. I mean, you can pray and you can speak tongues and you can do all kinds of things. But without a process and understanding what the market works, you're not going to get there. So fast forward. I told this doctor, Swiss doctor friend of mine, that I wanted to go into this security business. And he said, well, he stops at commercial, where I am selling to offices, finishing equipment. If I wanted to learn more, I needed to go to Korea. And then he had a friend who produced this machines and so on and so forth. He was going to introduce me. And he liked me for some reason. He said, Moses, you're the first black person I've ever sat with. And I find you very interesting. Because you're straightforward, you're well educated, and you're extremely intelligent. So he took me under his wing for no cost, right? And he gave me a credit of a million dollars. Just like that. No security. He doesn't even know where I live. He's never been to Ghana. He will never come to Ghana. Actually, he's actually passed away without actually coming to Ghana. You know, the lesson there is that when you're in business, you have to be clean. You have to be credible. You have to be trustworthy. The people that are accomplished, that know the world, they can look through your soul. They can tell where you're coming from. They can tell whether you're straightforward. They can tell whether you're clean. And they give you things for free. He gave me a million dollars of credit. I was only 25 or 26. So I didn't need to borrow from the bank. And he introduced me to another guy who is still alive, called Yong Pyong Kim, who still lives in Korea. He taught me everything I know about manufacturing, engineering, and substrate, and all that. For several years, I used to spend time in, in Korea, 10, 20 days in Korea, and I used to travel with him all over the world for free. He also gave me credit for another million dollars because he liked me. So here was I under 30, I had credit for two, $2 million, and most people borrowed money at high interest rates because I never defaulted. If I said I'll pay you on Monday, I'll pay you on Monday, and on time. If I give you my word, it was my bond. But as my company grew, it gets a little more complex. Some people in the chain might not keep their word, and then now you have to stress, right? But trust, faith, and being decent and honest is in the long run very important. More than any maneuvering or any sleight of hand, you know, that will get you to places in the short while, but not in the long term. So I learned about these uh, security, about documents deeply, forensic, and so on and so on. Now, I'm still in my 20s. One day, I saw a state political car parked in front of my father's boys, because that's where I started my business, with one chair and a plywood hanging from the ceiling. This was like my, my dream office, right? Political car was parked there. And um, when they came out, this was an older, you know, very serious looking man. They said they were looking for Mrs. Baden. That was Mrs. Baden. That's me. I said, oh, you're a small boy. You are the Mrs. Baden. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do wrong? They said, well, our director of foreign affairs says we should come for you. So I said, really? Oh, I must be in some trouble. And so they took me in the car and we went to the research department somewhere. And near the red circle. And when he saw me, he said, What's your name, Moses Baden? Is your father Baden who lives in Takradi? I said, Yes. Oh, he's a great guy. He's my friend. You know, so that's why I said, No rags to rich. Sometimes your parents' good names can also take you far. And he said, We have a problem, a very big problem. And we've gone all over Ghana. And everybody says, There's some boy in Ringway. He's the one who can solve your problem. So I said, what's the problem? He said, oh, we made some Ghana passports. But because people were forging the passports, we changed the laminate page to hot laminate. And now we don't know how to laminate the passport. So I said, really, bring me the passport. So they brought me the passport. I had to look at it. I said, oh, hot laminate, that's easy. You need a hot laminator. So what's that? Bring me a proposal. I said, no, I'll bring you a proposal. Because I sent some proposals somewhere. People are stealing my proposals. 
I will bring you a solution. And he said, when? I said, give me two weeks. He said, okay. I was only 26 old. So I took a plane to South Korea to see my mentor, Kim. I said, Kim, these passports are Ghana passports. They are all laminate, but the pages are big. They can't solve the problem. I know you have a, a, a book laminator that can laminate passports. Can we try? He said, oh, almost that's easy. You need a hot roller laminator with infrared, and you need a zigzag pressure laminator. And then it's okay. Let's call the engineer. Bring, 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 bring the laminator. We put the thing in. It was a bit too big. He redrew the, put the, you know, the machine. It was rebuilt the next day. We put it in, laminated. I said, thank you very much. I took the laminator and my bag back to Ghana. <laughs> and when I got, so the day I said I was going to come and perform the magic, when I got there, a long list of old men, I was only 27. They said, I got the solution. I said, no problem. So I put on my laminator. They piled up the passports. I said it. Put it on. I put in the passport. Presto, laminated. So, Mr. Bailey, you saved us. We have 47 missions. It was my first international contract. Not only did I supply <laughs> laminators at 27 to all the 47 missions worldwide in Ghana to produce the Ghana passports. I also supplied the passport cutters, the presses. Why? Because I trained for a long time, and my time had come. So you have to prepare so that when your time comes, you'll be ready. People can't just go from zero to 100 just like that. It doesn't work like that. You know, you go in a direction, you have a vision, you build capacity. And one day, when people are looking for a solution, whether you are in a stay haystack or hiding than the people are looking for you, that's what creates business. So this was my first multinational deal. Now, I did this nomination for 10 years. I signed international maintenance agreements for these to be maintained, and I eliminated all these gather passports. It was a lot of money. I didn't even know what to do with it. You know, but back again, we reinvested the money into the business. By the way, I'm staying, we, and I'm not mentioning names, because I'm aware that we've got 30 minutes, and somebody better be giving me a marker so that we don't go too far. So I, of course, this story has debts owed to many people that if I started to mention, that would be the whole thing we do today by saying thank you to all of them. But different iterations of the margins team have supported us to get this far. This is not a story about me. It's a story about a group of people who are bold enough to follow a vision that's uncharted in order to arrive at a certain place. And I think that's what Lewis is about. That's what he wants me to talk to you about, about taking the path less than to be bold, to embrace change, to understand that the world is mutating. You can't stand still. You need to try something new. Sometimes you may be hurt, but you need to get up and dust yourself and go ahead by making things, by producing things, by actually developing solutions, by applying yourself, by putting teams together, by looking for the enlightenment, by looking beyond the normal. So whilst I was doing this, back to my story, <laughs> this passport thing, I said, oh, this machine I bought for Kim, it's a much longer story, but just, I bought for Kim and arranged for other people to carry on and made this nice business. It seems that this is a very good business because the margin is like so many percentages up and nobody understands how to do it. So identity must be a good thing. Passports, identity must be a good thing. So I did the forecast and I said, okay, in another 30 years, Africa will be 1.3 billion. There's nobody on the continent doing anything relating to identity or passports or anything like that. So I said, I will. When Africa is 1.3 billion, I want 20% of that market. But how are we going to get there? Now, this was 30 years ago, right? So, in 1995, 1996, we made a conscious effort to shift our business from the office equipment market, the subject market, into the identity and security market. So people would meet me and say, Moses, what are you doing? Your father took you to law school, you own practice, you're a teaching assistant, you have been a brilliant lawyer, walking around doing some silly things. I said, oh, I make ID cards. So what? You went to law school and you just make ID cards? I said, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I do. But why did you, why did you learn how to do ID? I thought you were an art student. 
I said, no, no, no. And then first when we had a class called four S. I actually went pure science and pure arts. And then the rest I was taught by other people. There's nothing that I know that I wasn't taught by other people. But you have to aspire and you have to desire and you have to move in that direction to be the people who are also going in that direction. And then they will take you along and then they will teach you for free what they know. And if you get a good mentor, you can get years of experience that you don't pay for. Two things. You have to prepare and you have to ask the right questions. They can hear you. The third one is that when you ask the question of a very, very experienced person and you get the answer, don't forget the answer. It's going to save you a lot of trouble. So all this time, everything I know has been taught me by people who had done it before and knew what they were doing. So I went into this ID card thing. Another story. One day, I saw in the papers, oh, they're going to have the non-aligned movement in Ghana. And we need somebody to make the ID cards for the, all the heads of state, secure ID cards. So, wow, I can do that. I think I was still in my 20s. So meet a state house, room something, bring your presentation. So I took my presentation with my team. And when we went, there were some big, big guys with suitcases. Oh, wow, are we in the wrong place? Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> and all of them were foreign. You know, so we, we went in there. And we were, we were, of course, terrified. And when we were the last, so when they called us in, there was all these big, big people. And we were so intimidated, waiting for our presentation. So I came in, I did my presentation, and then the chairman of the, of the, um, of the committee said, Mr. B. So I said, I'm 20 something. He said, what? How do you learn all that? I said, well, that's my business. And then he said, what school did you go to? I said, I went to France. He said, ah, that's why. I also went to France. <laughs> <laughs> Where is your office? I said, my office is in Ringway. He said, what? You can afford that office in Ringway? I said, yeah. So t tomorrow I come and see your office. So, oh boy. Now my father's boy school, this is my office. So what am I going to do? So this guy came. He came, he saw my, my plywood, one plywood office with my red phone and my, you know. But I did my demo and he said, wow. Mr. Baden, you, you're a very interesting guy. <laughs> but you're in this boy's school. Are you sure you can do this international job? I said, I tell you when I give you my word, I can do it. I have many backers, international backers. And he said, okay, because you went to a France firm and you were a deputy head boy and because of the presentation, and I'm going to give you a chance. But if you fail me, I'm going to kill you. And the rest is history. I delivered. We delivered. We did the dollar light movement. We made a lot of money. We kept the faith. And we got the reputation. <laughs> How many minutes am I on? Oh, time is up. Okay. So, well. Give me five more minutes. So fast forward, we built on this identity thing. Africa, 1.3 billion people at this time, 20% of the market. We learned how to, to make ID cards, software. We did trading with other international companies, took their intellectual property, exchanges for technology. We learned how to build factories. We built the first card body factory in the whole of Sub-Saharan Africa, right here in Accra. We produced the national ID cards, the first ones in 2007. We produced the current one. We took off for the government, we conceptualized, we designed, we built, we financed a quarter of a billion dollars of this project ourselves. All these bright margins people here, including our factory manager, Elan here. We brought people together. People said they couldn't be done, and we delivered. And today, our products are in all your pockets, whether you know it or not. <laughs> if you have a Visa card, you have a MasterCard, you have a bank card, you have a National ID card, you have a National Health Insurance card, you have a driver's license, you have a vehicle registration card. It's produced right here in Ghana by Ghanaians. <laughs> if you see the software in your bank doing the verification, 
the digital platforms in GRA, in NHIA, in NIA, in 125 rural banks, in all the universal banks, microfinance, all this is developed right here in Ghana by Ghanaians. And we're going global because that's our intention. We're going global not just because we want to make money, but we want to build a multinational company right from the center of the earth so that other people will be encouraged to do the same. So we can liberate our country, so we can liberate Africa. So we can give confidence to people that if we can walk on water, then so can you. That's why we have the Christ on our board, and that's why I'm speaking here. Thank you very much. No, no, no. no. Thank you so much. Come on, let's put our hands together. Made in Ghana by Ghanaians. Made on the continent by the people from the continent. We're going to give you two minutes to woosa because we've got questions for you. You have 10 minutes, so have a seat, decide on whether you're mm. going to cross your legs or slant your feet, sip some water. But before the questions, I mean, get your questions ready. And I promise you it's not intentional if I don't get to you because we only have 10 minutes because we have our master class coming. Are you ready to catch this ball? Who's ready? I mean, come on. <clears throat> All righty. Let's do this. That's a low ball. That's, that's, you know. You ready? All right. Wait, that's too much. <laughs> you know what? That's way too much work for me. I'm going to pass it to you, and you pass it to someone else. All righty. All righty. Let's go. Get ready, guys. There we go. Awesome. Come on. Keep working the room. Let's go. Be gentle. Be kind, please. It's not a competition. All right, be ready. Come on, let's go. Don't hurt anyone. It's a game. Fantastic. Let's keep going. Work the room. Come on, let's go. Whilst you're throwing, I hope you're thinking about your questions, or else I'll ask all the questions. We're not ready yet for Q&A. We'll be, we'll be ready. We'll be ready. Let's. But it's so nice and heartwarming to hear that our very own, and this is why we're here, the bold new normal, made in Ghana by Ghanaians for Ghanaians, made on the continent for the continent, and beyond just made in Ghana for Ghanaians and for the continent by us, I mean, it's global. They're doing things, your visa, like he said, your driver's license, you know, your transactions. So I think Margin's ID Group deserves another round of applause. And um, I truly like what Margin's has done um, for the Bold New Normal. They have been a partner in many ways, beyond, like I said earlier, writing a check. He's here, the CEO is here. I'm sure he has a ton of things to do, but he's made time. Remember when we were speaking about the word... to pour into us, to, to advise us and to guide us on how we can create our own story, on how we can create our bold new normal. So on that note, I would like to take some questions. Um, I would like to first take a question from someone who has not been able to ask a question today first. Let's be fair. Um, thank you so much. And what we're going to do, again, we'll try to consolidate our questions. So if we have a second question now, we can ask our first a second, and then we can keep the questions going. So please go ahead. Um, my name is Elizabeth. Mr. Bay, you know, I've been around a long time to know margins. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may be the oldest in, in, in the room. <laughs> Even though I may not look it. But you have given us um, a summary of how to build a business. Where you started from, how you innovated, and the integrity with which you have worked gives us a, a, you know, a blueprint, as it were, as to how to start and manage a business. And I cannot be more grateful and thankful in, for being here. Even though, I'm, I, I, as I said, I may be the oldest in this room, for me, it's my phase two in life. And I, just yesterday when I, I, I got the SMS again, and. You know, I am an older dear lady. So, you see, <laughs> even though my big brother uh, uh, is a Kwabuchi, but uh, Lucy, because of Lucy, I decided to, to, to attend this, this conference. 
because I admire her from, from, from afar and I, I said, regardless of my age, you know, um, I think age is a number. And if I decide to be here among people who are oh, young, old or young enough to be my children, it means I am up to something. And as I said, it's my phase two. So yesterday I was just looking at the numbers and I'm like, if I take the number of years I held up, you know, I imprisoned, as I call it, uh, for my age, I'm 38 years. So I would, <laughs> I would start a new one. And you have given me food for thought, and I can't thank you now. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I'm and I'm Lucy for the platform, for the, for, the, for the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Um, we'll give the lady over there a chance to ask a question since we fumbled the very first one. But before then, um, our virtual audience, someone says, how, does one, how long does one need to build? What are the core elements? Is it about family? Is it about connections? So that's the second question. So remember hers, this question, and we'll take one more, and then you can answer, and then we'll take another round of questions. Please go ahead. Thank you. Please go ahead, sir. No, uh, Mr. Baden, please go ahead and answer. Oh, okay. So I guess the first one was whether it's about connections and uh, family. Family, yes. I, I said to you the principle of my father, right? That you have to train a child like a seven so that he can be a prince. You have to consider that it's actually most people that come from affluent income families don't do that well. And that's a fact. You can check that. The reason is because they have a, you know, a certain sense of entitlement. The things have to be done for them. So really, it could be a disadvantage if you come from a family where you're connected. Because connections won't guarantee you anything, right? And we're not talking about how to be rich. We're thinking about, talking about how to build a corporation. Two different things. A corporation that runs well, of course, will be rich. But to be rich doesn't necessarily make you successful. Neither does it make you capable of building uh, a corporation. Because it needs processes and systems and knowledge and a certain kind of passion to drive yourself through. One kind is a synchronon, right? You have the knowledge, you have the processes, you learn the systems, you understand how businesses work. You understand how risks can be managed. You understand how to build relationships, soft and hard skills. But if you're not passionate about what you want to do, you have all that knowledge, and it will amount to much. So I told you the story about how I had these two mentors who would give me a million dollar each of credit. None of them have been to Ghana before. You understand me? They've not been to Ghana before. They just like to be with me. They just thought they had this African pet who's 26, who's smart. They take me to all over the world, to Vegas, to wherever. I remember Dr. Ufis Vega used to take me to Vegas. And he said, Moses, we're going to go to Vegas. We go to the MGM Grand. It's the biggest hotel in the world. And his secretary sent me, if you send me your credit card, we'll book a new name for you. I said, well, I don't have a credit card. I can transfer the money, so forget it. The doctor's already paid. You know, and I was on the second biggest week in the whole of MGM. And I wasn't even 30. And then he would take me to Caesar's Palace. And then I'll sit by him. Then all these big people, big corporate people will come. And then they would talk, they would talk, they would talk. And then he would wait. Then they would ask, who's this young black guy? And then he would say, he's my African partner. Then they say, wow, you have African partners? He said, yeah. <laughs> then they would talk some more, they would talk some more. And then when they ask a question, he would say, Moses, what do you think? And then I'll answer. The guy would say, hey, what school did you go to? When you in Cambridge, I said, no, I was in the University of Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you build connections. We shouldn't feel limited. And that's also something that's in our mind. I mean, I'm so happy, unlike Lucy, 
I've never been, or the rest of my brothers and sisters, for so those of you who know them, they've been to Ivy League schools and you know, all these expensive schools. I mean, I just went to the University of Ghana. So my, st my story is authentic. <laughs> There's no connections. <laughs> Are you with me? But I employ people who went to Ivy League schools, right? You can name them all the best schools in the world, not just in Ghana, but in seven other countries. You know, and if people say, oh, it's because you have a network, it's because your father's rich, it's because you just, oh, me, no, I went to the University of Ghana. And in France, we have to blame them, right? So, network is good, but you can build your own network. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised. You attract like people. Are you with me? You have dinner with people, and they will say, oh, Moses, why don't you come to my ranch somewhere so we can have a conversation, we're enjoying this talk that we're having. You know, and all of a sudden, you're in a different network. But if you, are, you don't have anything to offer, if you are not interesting, if you don't have dreams of your own, if you are not audacious, if you are not bold, if you are not communicating something credible, if you are not writing a nice book and inviting me to come and speak, you don't bring people together. <laughs> you understand me? And so, networks can be created. I think it's internal. It's really not because of your background. It can help if you have your background, but your background could also be a disadvantage because it can limit your hunger. I don't know whether that answers your question. Thank you. So the second one was about... Um, corruption. How do you... Corruption. Yeah, yeah, corruption is everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> My father used to have a proverb, and I'm going to tell you the proverb. One day he called me and said, Moses, you know, the world is not... easy to understand. So let me ask you, if you are going on the road, and then you find a bar of gold, and the rules are that don't take the gold and don't leave the gold, what would you do? My father asked me, and he called me out of the blue. Come, come, come. Let me ask you a question. So I said, really? You can't take the gold? He said, no. And you can't leave it? He said, no. Simple. Use your common sense. It depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. He said, daddy, you're the only person who got this question correct. You're going to be a great businessman. What does that mean? You know, dishonesty, corruption, reaping where you haven't sown, Perverting the ways of justice, intentionally putting people in harm's way because of evil intentions is wrong. But corruption as a legal term is defined by law. So, you know, I have Danish companies and I have a lot of Danish people on my board. My main partner is a very great Viking called Mr. Peter Blom, right? He's been my partner for 30 years. He's one of my strongest warriors and he's a, an incredible person. Because any time I go and tell him, hey, Peter, we're going to run through snakes. He said, really? That's a fantastic idea. <laughs> and that's why he's my partner. Because if I told any guy him that they were no, this one, it's not going to work. <laughs> and it's one of the main reasons why our company is here today. Because he's bold. Are you me? So he said to me, oh, Moses, why is it that? When you go somewhere in Ghana, you have to tip the people. Don't they get paid? I'm like, yeah, they get paid, but in Ghana, they don't get paid like Danish people. So they need to supplement their salary, so you have to tip them. He says, well, is that not corruption? I said, no, it's nowhere in our law. <laughs> yeah, it's not me. It's the same like what I, my father asked me. Do not do anything that's against the law. Do not do anything that's immoral. Do not do anything that disadvantages other people and is wicked and evil and unfair. Be balanced, be just. It's a corrupt society. You don't have to do everything that appears to be an opportunity because shortcuts are dangerous. If you take a shortcut, you might never get to your destination. So I don't do anything I don't believe in. I don't care how much money there is in it. Yes, I mean, I have followed consistently for 33 years the vision that I want to build, to build a multinational African identity company. And I'm still doing that. 
if you want me to go and sell uh, cocaine or go and steal money from somebody, I'm not interested. Are you me? But look at the end of things from their beginning and look at the results of many stories. Many so-called corrupt, powerful people who want to make money on the short end, look at the end of their lives. Mm -hmm. It doesn't amount to much. I can tell you for a fact, in the life that I've lived up to now, I've seen many companies go and come, powerful people doing things that seemingly is going to make billions. What are they today? You have to make real things. Are you me? You have to have real solutions. You have to get up and produce things that people use and are willing to pay for it. If you don't do that, the end will not be good. I'm talking as a historian, and I'm talking from experience, and my business experience, that you the dollars and create a multi-million dollar company without being corrupt, without stealing money, without taking what is not yours. You know, I've been in a business deal, and somebody's come and say, hey, Moses, this water has 10. Why don't we make it 20? And then you can have eight, and I'll take two. I'm like, no, but this water has 10. How can we make it 20? It's, it's at the market. I'm a big deal. I can't do that. Look, you let's sell the water for 10. If you need money, I'll give you my own two. But if you go and sell it for 20, that's corrupt. If they catch you, you go to jail, and I'll be in trouble. So what kind of business is that? Everybody knows the price. Do you get me? But if you think nobody will see, it's easy. Because if you've got eight illegal money, that's a lot of money. Free money. But it depends on where you think you're going. I know where I'm going. It doesn't include overinflating prices. No matter what people say. Everything that I own, I can trace, I can tell you exactly how I acquired it. And there's not going to be any issue. That's the way I'm trained. Those are my values. And so for us, people like Lucy, who was written a book, people say, oh, but Lucy, what's she talking about? <laughs> but it resonates with me. Because we have to make things. We have to change things. You can't have a small cupcake and everybody's trying to cut a piece of the cupcake. Why don't you make a big cake? Mm -hmm. So when you have a slice, it's a thousand cupcakes. That comes from critical thinking. From starting small and envisioning a global enterprise and working for it. So I guess that's why we're here, right? <laughs> Corruption, it doesn't take you far. That's what I believe, in a way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll take our last round of questions. Um, the gentleman in the back, um, yes. Please introduce yourself right. and then ask your question. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Please, I'm Ronnie Asante. Yes, um, Chief, please. My question is that you mentioned when the big man came to your office and he saw your 27-year-old young man doing business. And I'm thinking that he might was thinking that maybe you can do it or something. But how do we prove ourselves to these big men that we will be bidding for contract before? Because I have been before a minister, I told him that there is a project I want to do, which I'm handling right now. And they tell me that, how can you bring the whole world to this country? How do you want to do that? And the minister couldn't believe me. But I have the capacity, I have the expertise, and I know what I actually want to do. How do we convince these people to see that even though we are young, but we can still do what we want to do if we get the support? Thank, Thank you. you. Then we'll take the two other questions and mm. then he can answer them all together. Charles, and then one more in the back. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is Charles Antipim, X Technology. Uh, my question for you, sir, is you talk about building a corporation. And so I'm really wondering, when it comes to hiring, um, what do you do? I've heard people say, hire for character and train for skill. And some also say, hire for skill and manage character. And so <laughs> in your experience, <laughs> how <laughs> do we um, hire the right people so that we can build an effective corporation? Thank you. Very interesting questions. Thank you. And then Let me have... answer the first with okay, a story. Sure. A real story, right? Because stories are better sometimes. Because once you understand the story, you know how it works. You remember that we did the first national ID we were, I, I formed a consortium of companies called Ghana Identification Company. And I went and told someone to tell President Kufo that we can do this ourselves. Why do they have to give to foreign people? You know, I mean, at that time I was building a factory. I've done identity all my life. I can do it, you know. 
And they look at me, this small boy, he can do what? And they said, no, okay, fine. Maybe you can do it, but you haven't done it before. We can't take that risk. So if you guys have come together as a consortium, then go and find somebody who's done it before and bid. And when you bid, we will look at a local content of every bid, and we will give it 15%. So we joined one of the bidders and we bid. And we won. Are you away? Although I believe that we could do it. So we, we did the first ID, we went through the iterations, we did a lot of work. At that time, we the factory. People don't know that we had the first ID cards, Ghana ID cards as well in Ghana. And, but later on, I figured out that, you know, President Kufo was very wise. Because actually, when we implemented that, I found that it was a little more complex than I thought. And working with that multinational company, I learned a lot. And then I discovered that the way they designed the project was wrong. Even though they, they had the technology and the know-how, the way they designed the project was wrong because it wouldn't work in our system. So the project sort of failed. And we had this factory. This was our, our offtake contract. The Danish government had helped us, given us a lot of soft loans and so on. And, and now we're in debt. We couldn't pay because the project had stalled. Come 2009, government changed. Things were going around. So I, I had to think. I thought, I said, no. This project, I can redesign it. Are you me? And it will work, looking at what happened before. So I redesigned it. But I discovered that there's no way they were going to give me the contract if I redesigned it for several reasons that you talk about. I'm a small boy. This one is done by multinationals. So I went to the chairman of NIE then, so Larry JT, very smart guy. And I said, I can redesign this, and we can rebuild it. And government doesn't have to put any money in it. He said, well, how's that possible? I said, okay, I can write it for you. And then you see what you think. So I wrote executive summary of what I was going to do in a public-private partnership. He said it to me. He looked at it. And he said, wow, this is incredible. You mean you bring your own money? That's the part. I said, yeah. I will raise my own $24.7 million. I will build the system. I will implement the project. And if it's not successful, I will lose the money. So, well, if you're bringing your own money, <laughs> and the government doesn't have to put any money in, and we don't have any technical risk, are you sure? I said, yeah. Okay, then go ahead. I said, well, then it's a pilot. If this succeeds, then you have to give me the main one. So, I didn't know where I was going to get the money from. I just said I was going to do it. So, once I made that commitment, now I have to figure out how I was going to raise the money. And I did. The rest is history. So, <laughs> life is not going to be easy. And, and that's what I think in Lucy's book, she talks about many difficulties. And, and maybe it's going to be tough. I mean, if you're going to succeed, it's going to be so tough sometimes you have to hide under your bread and cry. I mean, I've had situations where the bank has come and sold my properties. My bank sold, well, I was forced to sell six properties of mine that had no issues, just because of a business issue. I'm not going to mention where, but a lot of money. <laughs> you know, because when it goes bad, you are the guy who thinks you know what you're going to do. It's going to be your problem. So you have to take responsibility. There's no free lunch. You understand me? It's going to be difficult. If you want to be the first, if you want to get to where you want to get to, it's a near-death experience. It's never going to be easy. And so if you are ready for, for that, that means you're passionate enough. You're not going to sleep. And mind you, you can die in the battlefield, right? It's all part of the game, right? Okay, so that's the answer. Now to character. Character is more important than anything else. Because the person doesn't have character. You can't rely on them. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, if you hire a very clever chief, you collapse your company. <laughs> it's better to have a damp, honest person who may lose money but won't collapse your company than a smart person without character. That's one. But ability and going into the market to buy the right skills at the right price, at the right time of the history of the company or the journey of the company is key. People are the ones who make things happen. Processes, systems, certifications, and standards are important to know that you have a, a good foundation to go on. 
But they don't work by themselves. It's inspired people. And you have so many margins people here. And they are the ones who make things happen. You can see Alan, Alagovan and Sukumaran. And that's one thing. He runs the factory. I haven't been there in a long time. I don't need to go there because he's there. He has that way. And he's going to make things happen. And when he makes your Ghana card, you're sure the chip will not fall out. Because he's going to put it in our test, standard international lab, and run it a 10 year simulation. So the chips don't start popping out of your card. I have to believe in him. He's a man of character, he's a man of ability. He believes in his team, Ayumi, but he also has ability. So you have to have both. But if I had to choose, I'd choose character before the other. Yeah. Thank you. And then we had a gentleman in the back. He's already standing up with the mic. Thank you, and then can we take another one, please? Is it on? No. Okay. Mr. Baden, please, um, with the introduction of AI and then digitalization, where do you see the margin ID group in the identity sector in some years to come? Thank you, and then let's take one more so we can wrap it up. There we go. Big man, I saw it So my, my question is simple, right? No matter what stage of the business which you are, equity or debt, what would you say? <clears throat> okay, three interesting questions. I think three, before I forget, the first one was about succession, succession. and um, children and so on and so forth. I believe in one thing, business is about ability, not genius. Mm -hmm. So if my daughters want to be fire dancers, fine, but they're not gonna run my company. They can be shareholders because I'm their father, but they're not getting into the company. We only high on ability. And the difference between trying to get rich, like I said, or having a lifestyle business, and then building a real business, two different things. You can have a lot of money, if that makes you happy, and you can build some macular type business, all respect to macular businesses, but you're not scaling, and you're not using money as a tool for change. For me, money is a tool for change. As my father says, if you have money, you can defend yourself and you can use it to change things. And then you can use it for courses that you believe in and you can use it to support your loved ones when necessary. It doesn't mean go and waste it. My father never gave me money to waste. When I borrowed money from him from business, he charged me interest. When I asked him why, he said money has a cost. And that if I don't pay the cost, there's no business. And that if I want money for business, it's different from wanting money to go and have lunch. You know, there are principles. If you have the principles right, it should work. Let's not mix them. I don't know whether it answers your question. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I mean, it's a, it's a synchronon. I mean, if you believe that you, you are not that special and that you're going to die someday, then <laughs> if you're going to die someday, then you have to start mentoring people from day one. You know, I am working to make myself redundant, hopefully. It, it means getting the right team and training them properly and being sure that they are better than you in what they are doing so that you don't need to do. Then you're out of a job. So I'm working myself out of a job. That's the, that's the objective. Someday I'll be able to play golf and write books like Lucy. You know? <laughs> anyway, the, the, the other question was AI. 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 Okay. I mean, AI simply means that we, the two things that are happening. With large language models for different kinds of applications, we have, we're going to have machine learning at a level where if you bring up to a certain level, I believe you have a certain singularity. That singularity I have defined as a language of God. What it simply means is that if I train an AI to look at images and make sense of images, if I do train an AI to do animation myself, if I train AI, all these are machine languages, right? So if we lift them up to one large language model, since it's machine language, 
The AI can understand both images, language, text, whatever. So it means that because it's generated, now it can talk to anything that's intelligent. And it can be learning by itself. For identity, what does that mean? With the introduction of quantum computers, that means you can morph everything. I'm speaking, I assume that you're technical, that's why you asked me this question. But anyway, but with quantum computing, it means that cryptography as we know it cannot survive. In cryptography as we know it cannot survive. That means that I can take your finger, your face, and make it look like it's you, and make it live, and go to your bank account, we use this face technology, and take your money, and I can pass with the liveness detection. Because I can use the AI to morph, morph, replicate liveness. So for identity, it's a big issue. What we need is to have quantum-proof cryptography. Quantum-proof cryptography. It's a running battle. <laughs> uh, it's a running battle. But that running battle also gives opportunities for new business. So maybe you should go to quantum-proof cryptography. You'll make some money in the future. <laughs> yeah. So that's, there was a third one about. Debt. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's a rational question. I mean, every kind of financing is based on risk. You get me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me give you a story. Okay. So, I told you the story about the passports, right? Okay. So, in order to buy all these hundreds of professional computers, distribute them to more than 47 countries, sign management and warranty contracts, get people to manage it, have the money to buy it, ship it, take people to go and fix it there at 27. It's impossible. Are you me? So I had to go and borrow money from a bank. That kind of money, we're talking a lot of money, hundreds of hundreds of thousands of pounds in the 90s. Right? It could buy several houses, that kind of money. So now I had two choices. I could go to a company which had money and say, look, do this deal and give me a commission and handle it, which is the easy way out. That's why everybody's an agent. Yeah, you get a commission, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't like being an agent. So I'm like, no, I have to solve this problem. So I went to, instead of going to Korea, uh, Kim, JNP, where Kim makes the machines, I went to another friend in London who also sells laminators, but has no idea of these professional laminators. He sells commercial laminators. A German guy called Rehard. So, called Rehard is Moses. I got a deal for you. I'm coming to London. Oh, really? You're going to make so much money. Oh, Moses, really? Come. So I go. I said, Rehard, look, I want you to do a service for me. He says, what service is that? I said, look, I'm going to get a customer to open an LC to you. He says, for what? I said, for my product. What product? I said, it's a professional laminator. Okay, what do I have to do? I said, well, you know, you have to ask companies that I would give you in different countries to maintain these for you and to charge an invoice. And then you have to receive the LC from my customer. It will, be, it will be irrevocable, it will be transferable, it will be guaranteed by an European bank, and it will be at site. I said, well, then it's money. Yeah. So when you receive the LC, transfer this to Kim to send you the laminators, and then transfer it to these maintenance people to maintain the different countries. How much would you charge for that service? I said, Moses, but I don't, I don't even know what you're doing. I said, yeah, you tell me how much you charge. I can't remember the figures. Maybe he says, okay, for all these maintenance one year, I'll charge you 200,000 pounds. So I said, because he doesn't know my price, right? So I come to the customer. I say, you know what? This is the letter that this is my partner in London. This is my invoice. I've transferred the contract to him. So you invoice him and set up an LC to him. You know, I've signed an agreement with him already. He doesn't know my price. By the time he gets the price, he calls and says, Moses, you bastard, but you make all the money and you don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's alternative financing. If I did an MBA, I wouldn't do it this way. That's why I didn't do an MBA. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can we put our hands together for Mr. Moses Tracy Baden? Oh my God, what a spirited, exciting, energetic conversation. I hope you are as inspired as I am.
to think big, to be bold, to be audacious. What a story, a Ghanaian story, an African story, a global story, which ties perfectly into the bold new normal. Can we put our hands together for him one more time?